It's now my pleasure to welcome our technical keynote speaker, um, Dr. Mark Lewis. Uh, Mark is one of my colleagues at IDA. Uh, he is the director of the Science and Technology Policy Institute, uh, which is one of the three federally funded research and development centers operated by IDA. Uh, you're probably most familiar with our systems and analysis group that I come from and most of the people here come from. Uh, we also operate a, another set for uh, the National Security Agency, and then Mark's is the third. And that's a very interesting uh, institute because it deals with the, the scientific nexus that cuts across the whole federal government and national scientific community, dealing with not, with not only DOD issues, and, but also NASA is a major sponsor for Mark's group and the whole scientific community. Uh, Mark came into that position a couple of years ago with an excellent background as 24 years on the faculty at the University of Maryland and uh, the, the uh, Willis Young Jr. Professor and uh, the Chair of the Department of Aerospace Engineering there. Uh, and then in 2000, between 2004 and 2008, he was the Chief Scientist of the Air Force. So he, he approached those issues from the government perspective as well. So we're very much looking forward to hearing Mark's uh, remarks this morning. And we thank you for joining us. And please welcome Mark Lewis. Hey, thanks, Good morning. Well, good morning. Um, so let me start out with a quick show of hands. How many aerospace engineers in the audience? Great. OK, pilots. I see a bunch of my Air Force colleagues in the room. So I'm going to be talking to you today about a particular technical area, and actually the area that I've spent most of my, my uh, career working in, and that is the arena of hypersonic flight. That is flight in excess of about five times the speed of sound. Now, to those of you who uh, pay attention to news feeds and, and track, S&T trends, especially in the Department of Defense, you probably know hypersonics is the hottest topic right now. Um, and, and that's kind of rewarding to those of us who work in the field. And I'll talk to you a little bit about why I think that is and, and why that's important. But what I want to zero in on my remarks today is let me focus on some of the challenges that we face. And I think perhaps appropriate to this audience, some of the, the analytical and testing issues that are relevant to the field. So since we're not all aerospace engineers, let me start off with a little, little, little background about high-speed flight. Uh, you probably know that the Wright brothers invented the airplane. They flew their first airplane at a speed of about 20 miles per hour. It went less than 110 feet, which is actually smaller than the wingspan of the average commercial jetliner today. But that ushered in the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, aerospace era. Um, by 1947, Chuck, Chuck Yeager, flying in an aircraft called the Bell X-1, had broken the sound barrier which turned out actually not to be a barrier at all. But he broke the sound barrier, flew past the speed of sound, um, and ushered in the age of supersonic flight. Um, today, we have aircraft, and actually since, since uh, the late 1940s, throughout the 1950s and 60s, we've had aircraft that regularly fly at speeds in excess of the speed of sound in the realm of supersonics. What I'm going to be talking about today are vehicles that fly even faster, vehicles that fly in excess of about five times the speed of sound. Now, to the purist, there actually is no strict definition of the term hypersonic. Hypersonic generally means about five times the speed of sound or greater. Uh, if you got 10 hypersonics experts in the room, you'd get 11 definitions of what hypersonics means. But we all kind of agree that a few things happen when you go really, really fast. And those things that happen make analysis complicated. They make testing complicated, both on the ground and in the air. All right. so. We have been flying at hypersonic speeds for actually quite some time. It's not a new field. You know, I mentioned Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier. That was not hypersonic. That was sonic. But by 1948, a year after Chuck Yeager flew, we were flying sounding rockets, unmanned systems, but sounding rockets, uh, above six times the speed of sound. In fact, the picture in the far left that you can see is a gentleman by the name of Frank Molina. Uh, Frank was uh, one of the founders of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He's shown there standing next to a, a rocket that was called the WAC Corporal. It was a sounding rocket. After the war, the US had captured a number of German V2 rockets. They started experimenting with them out in, in, the, in the White Sands Missile Range. At one point, they put uh, a, a sounding rocket as an upper stage on a V2 rocket, fired the combination off. It took them about four or five tries, but they finally got it to work. And they exceeded about six times the speed of sound. Frank Molina, by the way, had an interesting uh, uh, follow-on to this. He, he became as a, one of the founders of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and at some point had an epiphany, gave up in, on engineering entirely, cashed out, moved to Paris, and became an abstract artist. So uh, I, I have friends who have seen his art. They say it was actually pretty bad. But, <laughs> but 
Um, throughout the 1960s, we actually had vehicles flying at uh, hypersonic speeds. And in particular, there was a vehicle program called the X-15 rocket plane. You know, any of you who've gone to the Air and Space Museum, when you walk into the main gallery, the opening gallery, you look up to your left-hand side as you come in from the mall, and you see this beautiful, sleek, uh, charcoal gray aircraft hanging from the ceiling. And that was one of the three X-15 vehicles that were built. And to this day, those of us in the field point to that program as the pinnacle of testing. Right? Three vehicles were built. Um, throughout the 1960s, they flew a total of 199 times. So every two weeks, roughly, an X-15 rocket plane took off. Uh, they flew out of Edwards Air Force Base. They were dropped off the wing of a large bomber, the B-52 bomber. The flight, the flight technique was you drop it off the wing, fire off a rocket engine, and accelerate to, uh, to various speeds. Um, the fastest manned powered flight in the atmosphere the record is actually uh, held by the X-15 vehicle. It flew at Mach 6.7 in 1967. The pilot was a gentleman by the name of Pete Knight. His son, Steve Knight, is currently the congressman who represents the district in California that includes Ed Edwards Air Force Base. Not surprisingly, he's become one of the congressmen who's particularly interested in funding hypersonic flight. So always, always knew who, know who your constituency is. Um, lower side of the chart shows you a number of other hypersonic vehicles. Every spacecraft that enters into the atmosphere from space is traveling at hypersonic speeds. Uh, spacecraft entering from low Earth orbit is traveling at about 25 times the speed of sound when it begins to enter the atmosphere. That's Mach 25, clearly hypersonic. Um, the Apollo spacecraft coming in from the moon were traveling even faster. Right? On a trajectory from the moon, spacecraft entered the atmosphere at about 36 times the speed of sound, Mach 36. And in fact, uh, Apollo 10 holds a record for the fastest human flight recorded, highest Mach number of flight. Um, one of the Apollo 10 astronauts, uh, General Tom Stafford, is still alive and well. We just celebrated his 87th birthday. And uh, I love to talk about that, that, that re-entry and what an experience that was. So we've been doing this for a while. What's new? What's new is the stuff on the upper right-hand side. And that is the pursuit of hypersonic systems that instead of slowing down as they come back from space, or instead of being boosted on a rocket on a ballistic trajectory, can actually travel for significant periods of time in the atmosphere. The picture that you see on the upper right-hand side, second from the right, is a vehicle that NASA flew called the X-43. And that holds the record for the fastest air-breathing vehicle. That is a vehicle that uses oxygen in the atmosphere as part of its combustion system. Fastest air-breathing vehicle that we've flown to date. That hit almost 10 times the speed of sound in 2004 and flew very much like the X-15 rocket plane, dropped off the wing of a B-52 bomber and then accelerating on rocket power. The vehicle on the far right-hand upper side is a vehicle called X-51. I'll tell you a lot about that in, in a few moments, because X-51 uh, also holds the record for the longest duration air-breathing hypersonic flight and is generally seen as the most likely precursor to a series of hypersonic weapons that have become very much the focus of work in the United States as well as in other parts of the world. What do you do if you can fly that fast? Well, there are a whole bunch of things that you could do in the atmosphere at hypersonic speeds. All right, on the right hand, on the far left hand side, you see a couple of weapons concepts. Imagine a cruise missile that can travel several hundred nautical miles at five, six, seven times the speed of sound. You can imagine the, the applications of that sort of system. I, I like to give the example that, that um, in the Clinton administration at one point, uh, they got word of a terrorist who was at his camp and decided to attack the, the camp with traditional cruise missiles. Those are subsonic cruise missiles flying at less than the speed of sound. It took several hours for those cruise missiles to reach their target. And by the time they hit the target, that particular terrorist had left his camp. His name was Osama bin Laden. So we had a chance to get bin Laden, but we couldn't get there fast enough. Imagine if instead of taking two hours to get there, imagine if it had taken five minutes. So that really changes the game. Now, there are a number of different types of weapons you can envision. Um, some would be air breathing. That is using oxygen from the atmosphere. It means you've got an inlet in the front of the vehicle. Oxygen comes in with air. It burns with fuel inside an engine, accelerates at the back. The other concepts actually would just be more traditional rocket systems. You put a hypersonic system, a very slender, uh, uh, a good aerodynamic performer on top of a rocket, boost it up to speed, and then it let, it, let it cruise back into the atmosphere. In the middle, you see uh, concepts for a hypersonic aircraft. That's been discussed as well. Um, some of you may be familiar with a vehicle called the SR-71. 
It was a spy plane that we operated throughout the 1960s. Could travel at about three times the speed of sound. Very, very successful program. It was the follow-on to the U-2 spy plane. The U-2 was designed uh, in the 1950s to take high-altitude photographs over Russia. And then the Russians figured out they could shoot it down. So we developed the SR-71, which flew so fast that they couldn't shoot it down. Well, at some point, all technology becomes uh, is, uh, offensive, defensive technology tends to catch up with each other. Imagine if instead of flying at three times the speed of sound, if I could fly at six times the speed of sound. Once again, I would have a platform that could penetrate and really would be very difficult to stop. Far right hand side of that slide, you see kind of the, 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 brass, the brass ring of hypersonic flight. And that is being able to fly into space all the way up to 25 times the speed of sound, but to be able to do it more like an airplane and less like a rocket. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, simple contrast. Think about when we were operating the space shuttle program uh, throughout the 80s and the 90s. The space shuttle required about three months and roughly 2,000 people to get it ready for launch. Every shuttle flight cost roughly half a billion dollars. Contrast that to an airline flight. You go to Dulles Airport, airplane comes in, docks at the, uh, at the gangway, they get all the passengers off, they get the luggage off, they clean the toilets sometimes. Uh, used to be they put new food back on, they don't even bother doing that. They get new passengers on. 20 minutes later, that airplane is ready to take off. So that's the contrast. Imagine if we could fly into space with that sort of model instead of a rocket model. But the reality is that's a long way off. Weapons, on the other hand, on the far left-hand side, those are actually very close at hand. And even more alarming, the US is not the only country working in this field. Uh, there's been a lot of press uh, 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 most recently uh, Vladimir Putin himself, uh, two weeks ago, was bragging about the array of hypersonic weapons that his country was developing. The Chinese have actually been pretty vocal about their development of these systems as well. Um, for those of us who've worked in the field in the United States, we find this particularly frustrating because this is a discipline that we invented. We created the field, we invented it, we did all the fundamental research, we did all the development, we did the initial tests, and now arguably, there are other countries that are, if not equal to us, uh, very, very close behind. And honestly, by some metrics, they've actually exceeded our capabilities. So as you can imagine, this is a tremendous concern. About uh, uh, a year ago, I, I, uh, I, I led a, a study with the National Academies that looked at how we would defend against other people's hypersonic weapons. Uh, what would you do if the Chinese developed hypersonic weapons to attack U.S. air bases, the U.S. Navy? What would you do if the Russians developed hypersonic weapons? Um, the report was classified, but I can, I, can, I can summarize the conclusions in the following way. Um, one, of the, one of the panel members on our committee was a former, uh, former Army three-star and former head of the Missile Defense Agency. And, and he wanted us to title our report, We're Screwed. Um, actually had a less polite version, but we talked them down to the, the, the more polite version. We ultimately didn't title it that way. But that was kind of the sense of the committee, that this is really quite an important issue that the US needed to, to face, not only from the standpoint of developing our own capabilities, but also addressing capabilities that other people will be developing. Um, another indication of, of, of the, the uh, global environment. So the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics is the premier aerospace society that runs the conferences, publishes the papers in the aerospace field. I suspect there are a number of AIAA members in the audience. If you're not, you should join. Um, every 18 months, AIAA runs a hypersonics conference. It's an international conference. And I have plotted on that chart the number of papers from three countries, the United States, China, and Germany. And notice that the number of publications, open publications, basic research publications from China has been skyrocketing. Now, there are a number of reasons for that. And one of the reasons that the US numbers are declining is we stopped talking so much about what we're doing because we realize everyone else is reading our papers. So that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But it clearly shows that, that the Chinese, as just one example, are investing not only in the military side, but also in fundamental research, which means investing in their universities and investing in their workforce. So you can imagine why this has become quite an issue. All right, so let's go back to why testing and analysis in this field is so difficult. When you're flying at very high speeds, a good rule of thumb is that the amount of drag force you are fighting to make your way through the atmosphere scales with roughly, roughly the cube of the velocity. So double your speed and the drag, the, the, the power required to force your way through the atmosphere goes up by a factor of eight. So that's difficult. When you travel at very high speeds, you have frictional forces. Air is rubbing across the surface of your vehicle, generating tremendous heat. 
Surfaces become very hot. That stresses materials. It also stresses your ability to understand what happens to the airflow moving over that vehicle. Because chemistry starts to become important. Nitrogen molecules start to break apart. Oxygen molecules start to break apart. They can react with the surface. That can change the pressure distribution over the vehicle. So getting that right is important. I mentioned we've been developing systems that can breathe air, that can use oxygen from the air to power their way through the atmosphere. Well, those sorts of engines are relatively new, and not new in principle, but, but new in practice. And so developing those engines has proven to be a challenge. Another key issue of these vehicles, by their very nature, they have to be quite slender. And the aerodynamics forces you to configurations that are really fully integrated. By that I mean a hypersonic vehicle is best thought of as a flying engine. The front of the vehicle acts as the front of the engine. The back of the vehicle acts as the back of the engine. Right? The, what you do, the changes you make to the four body surfaces will also impact the way the engine performs. The things that you change in the back of the vehicle impact the way the, the, the engine performs. And so it's fully coupled in a way that exceeds almost any other flight system of which I'm aware. And so that makes it a very difficult challenge. Testing is also extremely difficult. And I know that's going to be that's a focus for this audience. It's difficult to simulate conditions on the ground, difficult to simulate conditions computationally. And it's also very difficult to test this stuff in flight because flight is expensive. Let's zero in on this. So we generally argue that aerospace engineering rests on a three-legged stool, that is analysis, computation, and test. Here I've broken test into two categories, ground test and flight test. There are parts of the community that like to argue that ground test is becoming obsolete, wind tunnels are going out of style, we can do everything with computers, we don't need it anymore. Uh, if, if you walk away from this discussion with, with any other thought, it's that's completely wrong. Ground test is still extraordinarily important. And I'll give you an example in a moment of why that's true. What's difficult about analysis? Well, we've had seven decades of theoretical development in, in the field of hypersonics, and yet it turns out there are some fundamental questions we still don't understand. Things that we can answer about a low-speed airplane, I cannot tell you about a high-speed airplane. Uh, just one example. If I wanted to figure out the nature of the flow moving over the surface of a wing, right, at low speed, I could tell you exactly what the properties of that flow are based on the speed, the size of the wing, the altitude at which the aircraft is flying. I can tell you whether it's smooth and laminar, or it's rather, whether it's rough and, and turbulent, and I can tell you exactly where that transition occurs. We have decades of analysis, decades of theory, decades of experimental data that will tell us that. I can't do that at high speed. The most fundamental question I could ask about the flow over the vehicle is, is it smooth and laminar, or is it rough and turbulent? We can't pin that down right now. We don't have the analysis. We don't have the data. Even worse, up until about five years ago, we thought this wasn't such a big problem because, well, we'll, calculate, we'll do the calculation assuming it's all smooth and laminar. We'll do the calculation assuming it's all rough and turbulent, and reality term will obviously be somewhere in between those two. It turns out that the state in between those two is worse than either laminar or turbulent for a variety of conditions. So our fundamental assumptions were wrong. But that makes this quite difficult. And to make it even worse, the basic equations that I might solve to understand flight at these speed regimes start to become invalid under certain conditions. When I model the behavior of flow moving over an aircraft, I'm doing it assuming that the air acts as a continuum, which means I can ignore the behavior of individual molecules. I treat it as a statistical whole. At very, very high speeds, temperatures become high. Remember, friction drives up temperatures, surfaces become hot, gas becomes hot. Densities become low. Molecules start to become separated at large distances, which means our basic assumptions of fluid behavior begin to break down. So that's quite a challenge. Yeah, I know every practitioner of a field wants to tell you that their field is really difficult. But in this case, it's true. <laughs> all right, computation. Say, OK, no problem, no problem. I can handle all with computers. Computers are wonderful. They're fast. I just put the equations on a computer, and it's all good. Well, remember, every computer simulation is just that. It's a simulation. When I solve for the equations of fluid motion on a computer, I'm doing it by breaking my problem into discrete points. That immediately introduces errors. No computer code is perfect. No computer code can exactly capture all the physics. In part, at hypersonic speeds, because we say the equations are mathematically stiff. That means there are things that happen on very, very small time scales and things that happen on very, very long time scales. And that combination of time scales makes it difficult to solve in this regime. 
Same problem that we have in analysis. We don't know if the flow is really a fluid or whether it's separate billiard ball molecules. So we don't know if it's continuum flow or the flow acts as, as individual molecules. You have to include chemistry to get this right. So in addition to solving for the equations of fluid motion, which are pretty complicated, you got to add in all those equations for all those chemical reactions in the air, including the breakdown of nitrogen and oxygen and how they react with surfaces. All that stuff starts to become important. It's difficult to resolve structures like shock waves. A shock wave is a jump in pressure and temperature that occurs at supersonic speeds. It occurs on the scale of a few molecular collisions. That's very difficult to capture in a computer code. So we say, all right, great. Let's go to ground test. Well, ground test is also a challenge. First of all, our infrastructure is aging. Today we have exactly two wind tunnels that can test a high-speed air breathing engine. One sits at NASA Langley, the other sits in Tullahoma, Tennessee at the Air Force's Arnold Engineering Development Center. The one at NASA Langley has a nozzle that's several hundred hours past its lifespan. So it could fail at any moment. Good news is NASA's actually putting money into rebuilding it, but it's still running at risk. The one in Tullahoma is a great facility that right now is down because they had a testing problem. All right? So that tells you how precarious our infrastructure is. Um, not only are our, our, our facilities precarious, our workforce is a bit precarious as well. We've got an aging test workforce. All right? uh, two years ago at IDA, we did a study that looked at the total number of people working in high-speed wind tunnel testing. We found a grand whopping total of about 500 people. So if you put that workforce on the list of endangered species, they're somewhere near Bengal tiger. Um, even worse of those 500 people, about half of them were government, and about half of them were uh, contractor force. And that contractor force is, frankly, somewhat fungible. So programs are up, you got people. Programs go down, you lose them, and you lose their expertise. That's quite a problem. And the other challenge that we found when we looked at that workforce, and here, is, speaking as a university professor for most of my career, I thought, wow, they're all going to be you know, uh, undergraduates in aerospace engineering and master's graduates and PhDs. Turned out the largest part of the workforce we, most, we, we, we needed to be most worried about were the folks who were the technical people, uh, you know, the pipe fitters, the folks who knew how to build models, the folks who knew how to put sensors and gauges on models. Right? That's the workforce that's most rapidly diminishing. Um, even if you had great facilities, it is important to remember that no single ground test facility can completely and totally reproduce all flight conditions at hypersonic speeds. If they get the temperature right, they don't get the pressures right. If they get the time scale right, they don't get the viscous effects. They don't get the, the, the effects of, of shear forces correct. So every test you do on the ground is a compromise. What about flight tests? Say, okay, well, if I'm flying it, that's great. That's the actual thing I'm testing. So that's got to be the ultimate way to do it. Well, there again, we've got aging infrastructure. I pointed that on the X-43 program, we used the B-52 bomber just like the X-15 rocket plane. The youngest B-52 bomber that the Air Force owns is older than I am. I won't, let, I won't tell you how old that is, but it's quite old. Right? I was actually at the first flight test for a vehicle that I'm going to talk about in more detail, the X-51. The B-52 bomber that was carrying the X-51 out for its flight test taxis out to the runway. My god, you would think people were burning incense and singing incantations that they got this airplane up and started. All right, it's got eight ancient engines. Half of them look like they're about to fall off the aircraft. And, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's remarkable that, the, that we're able to get anything done. Um, flight test is also very expensive. Extremely expensive. I'll show you some flight test programs that ran into the multi-hundred millions of dollars. And I would argue that we have gotten ourselves into a mode of horrible, horrible risk aversion. The X-15 program that I talked about, 199 flights. They took risks. They lost an aircraft in flight. They lost the pilot in flight. It went to a flat spin. It didn't end the program. They figured out what went wrong, and they kept on flying. At one point, another X-15 landed hard, landed so hard that it broke in half. What did they do? They decided, well, they wanted to build it longer anyway. So they actually added a center section, had the aircraft in the air in a couple of months. That was, risk aver that was, that was not a risk-averse culture. We are in that culture, unfortunately. All right, so let's talk about some failures and how analysis gets you wrong. The impetus for a lot of the work we do in hypersonics came in the 1980s. President Ronald Reagan went on national television and said, we're going to build a hypersonic airplane. It's going to take off from any runway. It's going to fly up to Mach 25, 25 times the speed of sound, all the way into orbit. It was also going to be the Orient Express. It was going to take off from any runway, go from New York to Tokyo in less than two hours. And that vehicle, as proposed, was going to be 50,000 pounds. This came out of a DARPA study, by the way. 
several engine companies, several airframe companies were given money to start developing this vehicle, develop the concepts, and even started building hardware. By 1993, when the NASP program, the National Aerospace Plane Program, was finally canceled, it had grown to 450,000 pounds, which is, by any measure, a failure of analysis. Now, whole volumes have been written about what went wrong in this program. They spent $1.2 billion to come to the conclusion that they couldn't build this thing. But an important lesson is, in aerospace, weight is money. So when you go from 50,000 pounds to 450,000 pounds in your design, you've increased the cost of your vehicle by at least an order of magnitude. And that made this vehicle completely untenable. In fact, the estimated cost for a national airspace plane vehicle would have been about $12 billion. And when that price, price tag hit, the program was canceled. But at the, at the most fundamental level, one can argue there was a total analysis failure in this program. They were envisioning the flight of a vehicle at 25 times the speed of sound before we had even flown at five times the speed of sound. It was going to be dependent on the operation of a particular type of engine, a supersonic combustion ramjet. The engine that we think is the key to flying at these speeds. They were, in, they were building a vehicle based on that engine before we had ever actually flown one of those engines. Quite remarkable. This thing needed several miracles to happen. Now, that hasn't ended the string of failures, all right? The program was ended in 1993. Let's talk about some other failures that we've had. Um, in uh, uh, the US Navy in the 2000s had a program called HiFly. HiFly was essentially a hypersonic missile. Really clever design. It's a beautiful design of an engine that came out of the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. HiFly was about a $150 million program. They flew it three times. It failed three times. Those three failures had absolutely nothing at all to do with the hypersonic thing they were trying to test. The last failure, they had a low battery voltage on some initiation in some initiation sequence. They uh, dropped the high-fly vehicle off the wing of the carrier aircraft, and it landed harmlessly in the ocean. What was our response? Well, we canceled the program. On the upper right-hand side, you see a program called the HTV-2, Hypersonic Test Vehicle 2, $600 million, zero for two flights. Let's see, anyone from DARPA in the audience? OK, good. So DARPA declared this a tremendous success. Uh, it was supposed to fly for 20 minutes in the atmosphere. The first flight lasted for eight seconds. But the press releases said, tremendous success. They learned a lot. And they figured out what went wrong, and they were going to fly it again. And the second flight lasted for eight seconds. But it failed for an entirely different reason. But I'll tell you a little bit of background on the HTV-2. So um, when I was in the Pentagon, I got a phone call from a friend of mine at the Air Force Research Lab about this program. And he said, they're, about to fly the, they're, they're getting ready to fly the HTV-2, and they've never put it in a wind tunnel. And I said, OK, that's a really bad idea. So we called up the DARPA program manager and said, you know, you really need to put this thing in a wind tunnel. And he said, nope, too expensive. We don't need to. We've got all the computer simulations we need. It's going to work. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. I reminded him the Air Force was fitting, footing part of the bill. And I said that if you don't put it in a wind tunnel, we're not going to continue footing part of the bill. And so DARPA reluctantly said, OK, if the Air Force pays for it, you can put it in a wind tunnel. You can test it just as long as you don't add much, much, uh, you don't shift the schedule to the right. So HTV2 was put in a wind tunnel down at NASA Langley at that eight-foot tunnel I mentioned a few moments ago. Quickly figured out it wasn't going to work. There was a problem in the design. Uh, the boundary layer was supposed to have been laminar. It turned out it was going to be turbulent. That changed the effectiveness of the control surfaces. So the team quickly did a redesign. They tested it. They brought it up to the Air Force's Arnold Engineering Development Center. It was tested some more. It was on the ragged edge. They weren't sure if it would work. So DARPA was told, hey, you need to put this thing in a wind tunnel. Tested a little bit more. DARPA's response was, no, we've tested it enough. We did exactly what we said we were going to do. You got the data. Let's go to flight. They went to flight. Failed exactly as was predicted by the folks who did the initial test in the wind tunnel. Now, here's where there's kind of a good news story. So the fellow who had called me up from the Air Force Research Lab, who told me that DARPA wasn't going to put this thing in a wind tunnel, by the time this thing actually went to flight, he had moved to DARPA and was the DARPA program manager running this thing. So he had inherited this. And so as soon as that first flight failed, he called up his friends at the Arnold Engineering Development Center and said those magic words that every wind tunnel operator dreams of hearing. How much time can I have? Money is no object. <laughs> and they tested the heck out of this vehicle. Too late to change it. That led to the second failure. But a lot of data, data was acquired. All right, so we haven't had only failures, though. We've had some significant successes. And I want to talk very briefly about these, and then I'll move on to my favorite. Left-hand side is arguably the first flight 
of a, an air-breathing hypersonic engine. There's a program called HiShot. This is not a United States program. This was done by a university team in Australia. They did this for about a million dollars out in the Australian outback. Failure was an option with them. Their first flight, they lost the fin. They were ready to fly two days later. Um, in contrast, the vehicle in the center is that NASA X-43 vehicle that I mentioned. Still holds a speed record for fastest jet-powered flight in the atmosphere. They flew in about the same time frame. Interestingly enough, they had a fin failure in their first flight, just like High Shot, only they spent a year figuring out why their fin failed. Um, the X-43 was, by any metric, a much more extensive vehicle than the High Shot vehicle. It was a fully integrated vehicle, aircraft. It had an engine integrated with the rest of the airframe. It produced thrust greater than drag. But X-43 was about a $300 million program. High Shot was a million dollar program. So it points out that you can do some really good things if you've got smart people thinking problems through. And also, universities work cheap. That's another, another message in there. All right, so I promised to talk about my favorite vehicle, which is X-51, in part because I got to name it, and it was an homage to the X-15. X-51 was the Air Force's program to once and for all develop a weapons class hypersonic flight test bed. About the size of a missile, 14-foot vehicle. It is not a missile. It doesn't have a warhead. It doesn't have a missile guidance system. But the idea was to, to, to work out, to experiment, flying at high, high speeds in the atmosphere for extended periods of time. The program operated between May 2010 and May 2013. There were four flights. Two were successes. The first flight flew for 143 seconds. That was 14 times longer than the NASA X-43. You might say, wow, 143 seconds. That doesn't sound like a lot. Well, a molecule of air spans about one one-thousandth of a second inside the engine of X-51. So 143 seconds is 143,000 flow path intervals through the engine. So in the hypersonic realm, that's almost infinity. So we were delighted to get that much time. Flight two, we had a failure at ignition. Uh, vehicle never really, the engine never really fired off. Learned a lot in that DARPA tradition. It was a great flight. We learned a lot, even though it failed. Flight number three, that was just an embarrassment. Fin fell off the vehicle, got no useful data. You'd think we would know how to build fins. We didn't. And then we got to flight four. And flight four, I call kind of the Lindbergh moment. 210 seconds of powered flight. The engine operated as long as it needed to operate. It basically, it stopped powering the vehicle because it ran out of fuel, which is exactly what you would have expected. Most exciting thing that came out of flight four is the fact that there was no excitement. The vehicle performed exactly as analysis and wind tunnel experiments had predicted it would. So that's a success story. Let me point to the big failure in this program. Remember how many flights the X-15 program had? 199. We had four. At one point, the program dropped their funding down to two flights. I was still in the Pentagon at the time, and I actually threatened to cancel the program myself. I said, two floats, flights won't get you anything useful. We were predicting about a 50% success rate, which, which was completely accidentally correct, by the way, 50% success rate. But look at what happened. So we do flight one. Flight one is almost perfectly successful. Except at the very end of the flight, there was a burn through in the nozzle. A seal that connected the nozzle of the engine had a leak, and hot gases were leaking out. Not a big deal. Within the first 10 minutes of analyzing data, we knew exactly what went wrong. Look how much time we spent between flight one and flight two. You needed an accident review board, failure analysis. We needed to figure out what went wrong. After almost a year, we concluded that the thing that we thought went wrong on the very first day was exactly what had gone wrong. So why do we spend so much time doing that? Well, after flight one, you only had three flights left. So by gosh, you better get those three flights right. Then we go to flight two. Flight two has this engine failure, ignition failure. Wow, that was a real hardware failure and required a redesign. So look how much time that took, right? That was another year, another investigation board, another gnashing of teeth, even though within the first month, people knew what went wrong. Now we got to flight three. Flight three was a dumb mistake. Fin fell off, all right? Tell you what happened after flight three. We had a lab commander who wasn't sure he was even going to allow flight four. Flight four, the vehicle had been built. It was sitting in the shed. It was ready to go. And you had lab leadership saying, what if we fail? That would look really bad. Let's just put it in a museum. Talk about risk aversion. Comrade heads did, did prevail. But you see what happens when you get into a program of this type and you have too, little, little, too, little, too few tests involved. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about cost. So the total cost of the X-51 program came in at about $300 million. Each additional flight would have cost about $10 million. So think about that for a moment. Penny wise, pound foolish. All right, and since then, 
we've had a lot of fits and starts. And, and a lot of these are fits and starts due to ground test, some due to flight test, some due to uh, risk aversion. Um, long list of programs, and I won't belabor all of them except to show you that almost every single one of those programs that we've done in hypersonics was either canceled or discontinued for one reason or another. Big theme in the field. When the program fails for technical reasons, we cancel it. When the program fails for reasons not related to technical reasons, we cancel it. When the program succeeds, uh, we also cancel it. And you wonder why the Chinese and the Russians are making progress. All right, so let me close out with some current status. Kind of the good news, and I think the good news is there's a lot of recognition that this is an important realm. This is a realm where we are losing our lead, and this is a realm that has significant Department of Defense implications. Um, on March 6th, the brand new Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, Dr. Michael Griffin, previous NASA administrator, uh, uh, had some words to say about hypersonics. He said, and I quote, the US has to be better than any other challengers in the hypersonics arena, and anyone who doesn't see it that way, I have no time for you. And that's a pretty bold statement coming from the brand new Undersecretary of Defense. Um, he also was asked to rank his, te his technology priorities. He said number one technology priority is hypersonics. That's good news. At least he's recognizing the problem. Can he fix the problem? Not sure, but he recognizes it. Um, just two days ago, uh, General John Hyten, who's the commander of US Stratcom, was giving testimony, and he talked about the hypersonic lighter threat from both Russia and China. Uh, so he, he read our National Academy's report, so that's good. So he's figured out we're screwed. And um, he talked about in the context of, of Vladimir Putin's most recent, recent statements, but also pointing out that the Chinese development of this technology uh, poses significant risks to the, in the Pacific theater, to the US Navy, to the US Air Force. Uh, our air bases are a threat, our Navy is a threat. And to meet this challenge, we've actually seen in the last year or so, uh, the services, Air Force, DARPA, uh, the US Navy. Now, actually, yesterday I saw a note that the US Army is getting to the act, and the Missile Defense Agency are all getting involved, and that includes a return to flight test. DARPA's got two programs right now underway that they hope to get back in the flight test. Um, the Air Force is joining in those programs, so that's, that's kind of good news. Uh, NASA had cut their funding all the way down. Uh, several years ago, they were spending about $60 million a year. Not a lot of money by government standards, but still enough to keep an intellectual effort going. They dropped it down to $5 million a year a couple, year, a couple years ago. And now, in the, in the latest NASA budget, they're back up to $30 million a year. All right, not a tremendous amount, but at least enough to keep them intellectually engaged. And I think probably the best news at all is that with all of that comes a focus First, on test and evaluation. The DOD is reinvesting in some of the wind tunnels. There was $350 million put into the fight up uh, two years ago to reinvigorate hypersonic test facilities. There's a lot of focus on workforce. Lots of people asking about the university investments. Air Force Office of Scientific Research has been leading the way in that. They spend about $20 million a year at our universities. Office of Naval Research is ramping up in that as well. So making sure we have the intellectual capital is important. And that's workforce not only in academia, but also in industry as well. So I would say that the future right now is looking up. People recognize the problem, recognize the challenge. They're investing. Are we on the right path? It remains to be seen. But it's clear that in anything that we do, the sorts of issues that you're considering at this conference are absolutely critical. Be it analysis, be it test and evaluation, test on the ground, test in flight, absolutely critical to the advancement of this field. And with that, let me thank you for your attention. And, and if, do I have time for a question or two? Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Question in the back. In today's environment, how do we keep international cooperation up? So international cooperation is a great question. Um, you know, I mentioned, um, I mentioned uh, the Australian work, the high shot work. So that led to one of the best examples that I know of international cooperation. So the university lead and the high shot team Absolutely brilliant engineer, a fellow named Alan Paul, got hired by the Australian government, their Defense Science Technology Office, now their Defense Science Technology Group, set up a hypersonic group, and they then signed a cooperative agreement with the US Air Force for a program called High Fire. And that's been going on for about 10 years now. They're doing a whole series of tests in the Australian outback. That's brought a lot of goodness into our understanding of hypersonics. First, they've got some really, really smart people who understand the aspects of this field better than we do, including ground test and flight test. Second, it gives us a window into part of the world that we don't normally see. And third, they've got this wonderful test facility in Australia, this, this, test, uh, this, this uh, uh, flight test center called Woomera in the middle of the outback, which is the flattest piece of land you could ever imagine. 
uh, great for testing hypersonic stuff and picking it up off the ground. So yeah, international cooperation is, is key. Uh, honestly, I think there are some countries we will have more challenges cooperating with. China and Russia are pretty high on that list. Uh, complicated story with China, complicated story with Russia. But we also have European partners that we work very closely with. And even in, in South America, uh, the Air Force has had a robust relationship with several South American countries in the field. That's our question over on the left hand side. Uh, you talk a lot about offensive capabilities. What about defensive capabilities? Oh, phenomenal question. So why do you want to develop the offensive capabilities? Because it's hard to defend against. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Why is there any work going into def uh, defensive engagement? In fact, there is. There's a lot going in right now to defensive engagement. So, so I mentioned the Missile Defense Agency has stepped up to the plate. So they actually did not, did not previously have the charter, and now they do, to be the DOD executive agent to address defending against hypersonic systems. Important takeaway, these things are not impossible to stop. They're hard to stop, but not impossible. There's some attributes of a hypersonic system that actually, in some ways, make it easier to see, right? They're going so fast, they're glowing red hot, they're relatively easy to pick up on IR. Um, the challenge is they are moving very fast, so you don't have a lot of decision time to stop a hypersonic system, but there are certainly things that you could do. Directed energy solutions, for example. DARPA has a program looking at gun solutions that could be used to stop these towards the end of, of their flight. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's tough, but it's doable, and it's being addressed. Uh, rapid reusability anywhere in the future? Ooh, rapid reusability. Gosh. I'd like to get to that point. <laughs> but right now, I'm, ha I'm happy with, with rapid expendability. <laughs> so so we, we get to the, so in 2010, I, 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 I got to tell you a quick story. So in 2010, I was elected the president of AIAA, the Aerospace Society. And at the time, AIAA decided to go forward with a, with a series of technical challenges for the aerospace community. And one of them was green aircraft, you know, uh, 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 environmentally sound aircraft. So we did a press conference, and this reporter, and I'm unveiling this portfolio, and this reporter says, well, Dr. Lewis, you're mostly known for your work in hypersonics. Do you think hypersonics has any bearing on, the, on aircraft impact on the environment? And I blurted out, oh my god, if we ever got to the point where we were flying so many hypersonic vehicles that they're damaging the environment, I would be delighted. <laughs> and then I asked them not to print those comments. <laughs> so I'll put that in the same category. Do I have time for one more question? Um, do you see that there's a potential sort of threat of the culture of risk averse to stopping some of these other programs that are going on? Ooh, so you know, I think there are a lot of attempts to stop the culture of risk aversion. Um, it's, be, it's being discussed a lot. And, and, and uh, Mike Griffin, who I, I quoted from the New York uh, Undersecretary of Defense, has been talking a lot about that, getting back to a culture of experimentation. That's, that's probably um, a, a topic for an entire hour-long conversation. I, I will tell you that one of, my, one of my big concerns, and I see that addressed, is I saw this in the Pentagon. We have this tendency to want to do things that I call demonstrations. Right? And demonstration, I already know the answer. I just want to prove it to someone. And, and that, to me, is, is usually very flawed for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is if you're, if you're trying to prove it, that means you, you think you already know the answer. So, so why are you doing it in the first place? There are two possible outcomes. You either succeed and everyone says, well, well yawn, you knew you were going to work. Or you don't succeed and you fall flat on your face. And half the time you're doing a demonstration to prove it to someone, you don't even know who that person is. As opposed to experimentation. An experiment where you don't quite know the answer. You, you, think, you may think you know the answer, but you don't quite know the answer. And so any outcome that you get is a good outcome. Mike's been talking about experimentation, getting back into that culture. And I think part of that culture of experimentation carries with it the sense that you're willing to take risks. If you're doing an experiment, any outcome is a good outcome, assuming you don't just lose a fin. But any, any way the experiment goes gives you useful data. If you're doing a demonstration and you fail, that's always a bad outcome. And so I think that's, that's part of it. With that, I think I've probably run out my clock. Great. Thank you very much.